talking to you and 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 the question i'd ask you greg is and, and i know a lot of the background already why did you go to england two reasons ronald um one i was probably not overjoyed in the banking sector now i did we, it was time to move i didn't really didn't like working in the bank and i needed a bit of an adventure and um, and it was also time for me to fly the coop from home. Who influenced you? Who came up with the idea of going to England? I think it was PJ Williams and I sitting on the roof of the Commonwealth Bank one day before we threw our last flower bombs on the public. Did you get anybody? Did you hit anybody? Oh, yeah, yeah. We scored quite often. <laughs> well, I understand, Greg... Uh, and I know we you're called Paul to your close friends. Uh, can I call you Paul? Oh, Ronnie, why not? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <Bloody Tony. laughs> Paul, I believe you, you set up a bank account system uh, uh, with um, Mick Hobden, Buzz, Pete, Pistol and yourself. Yeah, and there were a couple of others too, and the conditions of the deal were that if you didn't, deposit your money on time you were out and there was one guy a big tall fella whose names he was outed because our rules were pretty strict um Greg, so there was more than just the four so there were other boys included at the time so there were a couple of guys that were interested and thought that they might like to come with us it didn't matter because we, we had a bank account and we contributed madly and we worked like dogs to put the money in there and uh, one of my fond memories was all of our fruit picking, particularly apple picking down the hill in most weekends. And we used to race down there, and I think it was Nick's father's truck. And uh, after apple picking, we'd load up all the reject apples in the boxes that we borrowed from the farm and go around knocking on doors at night and selling those apples. The only problem was the top two rows were in A1 condition, and they deteriorated further as you got to the bottom. Your marketing skills and selling ability was coming. Well, Ronnie, I reckon, I think, I can't remember the other guys doing much of that door knocking. I think I did most of that. Yeah, yeah, I would imagine they'd say, Greg, you go and knock on that door. We'll, 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 we'll back you up. And particularly for those public in Sandy Bay, Ronnie, when they're being told that these are the last of the season's apples and that there was going to be a major, major shortage, so grab them while you can. <laughs> See, that's, what marketing, Greg? That is unbelievable, isn't it? I, I, did you ever go up to Pontville? The boys talk about uh, working at the, yeah. the rifle range. Did you do that? Yep. Yeah, well, I was a, a member of the Pontville shooting club and introduced to that by a fellow called John Ford, who was the recruiting manager at the Commonwealth Bank. And he was a clean shooter, and I was a... I loved shooting and guns and all that stuff, so he actually organised my first 303 for me. He, he loaned it to me. And um, so I used to go up there a fair bit, and then we found out that we could get some extra money by working the targets up there, so I used to... I think I used to shoot in the morning, have a couple of rounds, and then race up the other end and work the targets. That, that's incredible. So that, that was another another little uh, income earner. What you did to raise money to, to go away, Greg, it's, it's incredible. I yeah, And, of course, the... No, owner... Ronnie, it's just it's where you come from, mate. Like, my, my father, any time I ever asked for something, he'd say, well, how much money you got? And kick your bum and get you out and go to work, mate. And uh, I was selling Herald's. As a young bloke, I can't remember how old I was. I was pretty young, probably about eight or ten or something. I used to get a halfpenny for every herald I sold at night. God, a halfpenny, God. Halfpenny, mate. And mate, I was loaded. Uh, what, Greg? Can you just remember how much the fare one way to England was on a boat? Can you just? Uh, can't right. remember. 
No, I've, I've asked... John, if John Kagan's still alive, take pistol to give him a and he'll tell you. Okay, that's interesting. <laughs> um, um, Buzz and Mick Hobden have left. They're gone. You're you're leaving a little bit later. Yeah, they went to the and Alan Pist and I went through the series. Yeah, they wanted to further their education in Panama City and yeah. those places. And places like that, okay. Pistol well, and I were more interested in the pyramids in Egypt and that sort of stuff. And so you're on the boat. Uh, what was it like on the boat, Greg? Fantastic, mate. It was like being blessed. <laughs> being blessed today is a picture that you guys have already seen of Pistol and I standing on the water and all that. And I think within about two hours, we were totally smashed. <laughs> And uh, that was our introduction to drinking Benedictine for the very first time with a fella called Frank. And um, it was just, it was great. We loved it. And we stopped at some good places and made some good friends. That's fantastic, Rick. And uh, uh, you you went through the sewers and you used Cairo, Port Said and all those type of places. And and as we saw on the slides, um, arriving... Oh, just before we go any further, any any anything happened on any of those trips, uh, you know, in like Cairo and places like that? Anything comes to mind that was a an event to be mentioned? Uh, well, the biggest one I can remember was that my father was there in the war, and he told me to be careful. Anything that was wrapped, anything that was wrapped, would have the contents that you thought it bigger. And um, we found that with. Some nicely camel skin bound books, that I, or albums actually, photo albums. Yeah. It turned out to be a block of wood in the middle with little lines on it that made it look like pages. Oh. They were wrapped in plastic. And uh, the same fellow that sold me that is that I um, managed to get my get my money back. But he actually traded me, that's right, he traded me with sunglasses for two of those albums and Pistol and I back on the bus and we had a look and opened them up and there was a block instead of pages. So I dived off the bus, ran back to this guy who was busily showing everybody's new sunglasses, gave him a little uh, friendly, if you know what I mean. I do. <laughs> and uh, grabbed my sunnies and bolted and I just got back to the bus before they were able to me. And uh, then the uh, language changed from not being able to speak English to calling us all those vaginal names and things like that. <laughs> So, Greg, through you... the window of the bus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, and, uh, uh, film, if you bought any film, there was no film in that. I think I've told you that before, Ronnie. No, I didn't no. know that. Yeah, you buy Kodak film and you, you know, you got about an inch of it hanging out the side of this, the uh, cylinder. Yes. A little cylinder that you pull across your camera and hook it up. Yeah. Before digital was invented. And anyway, pulled that, when you pulled the film out and wound it on about two clicks, that was the end of it. There's no film in the thing. <laughs> it was empty. Oh, and they they were the Arabs, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they just love to rip off the tourists. But anyway, I didn't listen to my father, but, you know. You were learning. So, yeah, we learned the hard way, mate. Yeah. Just just reflect again. I, 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 the phone went a bit funny, but just just recap the books, Greg. So they were, you went to this particular fellow who was selling books or... Yeah. Camel bound photo albums. And they're in plastic? Wrapped in plastic. And so when you looked at it, the front looked great. In the back, and he had one there that you could have a look at and flick through the pages and see how many photos you could fit in it. So you buy one of those that was already bound up plastic, ready for gift, gifting or whatever. And, uh, of course, there were no pages in these things. It was like a, 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 it was, it was like a block. A block, a block of cardboard, if you like, hollow, no Jeez. pages. With that happening, or that little event that took place, Greg, did it yeah. give you any ideas? Hmm. I might just... It might have given me some ideas that I wasn't too keen on Arab. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still not. I know. I remember the uh, the captain of the ship, when we we came through, he said, I'd advise you don't get off the boat. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, just we were dead lucky though, really. Now we didn't get into horse stuff. We were uh, totally, totally. And uh, I un I understand, Greg, that um, 
yourself and Pistol uh, got off in Naples. Yep, that's right. And all and dressed up in our trench coats with our thin club ties and our suitcases. Huh? No, no, we looked like a couple of watch thieves. I thought, <laughs> especially in our trench coats. <laughs> but we did have underwear on. Oh, guaranteed. And yep. and and um, Mick Hobson was there on time to meet you. Yeah, well, that bit is I can remember most things, but I can't actually remember where Mick met us. Uh, yeah, no, I can't remember that. Uh, uh, in speaking to Mick, that's the only that's the only blank that I've got. What did Mick tell you? Well, Mick just said um, yeah, there was an arrangement to meet you there at that particular time, that particular date, etc. Did he et turn up? And he was there right on time, and but and, uh, and Pistol confirms all that. But what gets me about that arrangement is communication, Greg. I mean, communication would be that you boys would be leaving at a certain time. Did he write a letter? Did he? Oh, I can't remember, Ronnie. That's yeah. the one part of the whole thing that I can remember lots of stuff that you and I have talked about in the past. But that yeah. particular bit, and uh, apologies to Ace. Yeah, but uh, I can't quite remember that little bit. Mm. But anyway, I do know that we took off to, to Pompeii virtually straight away. Yeah, went out into Vesuvius and had a look at Pompeii and um, and so on. And I think somebody lost their gear. Uh, it was it was I don't know, something was stolen. I can't remember whether it was my camera or pistols camera or bags or something. Yeah, but anyway, um, yeah. So. Um, did, well, that's the question. Mick didn't stay with us on our hitchhiking all the way to England, though, did he? So the, the story is, you arrived at Naples, you met up, and then you were going to not get on a bus or a train or anything like that and, and you know move forward towards England. You were going to hitchhike all the way. Yeah. A bit dangerous, do you think? Uh, you see, Ronnie, remember we lived in Tassie, mate, and crap and corruption hadn't been invented by then. And if it had, we didn't know about it. Yeah. So uh, we thought everyone was honest. We were trusting. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I reckon that's the way it'd be nice if people felt like that today too because there are still a few honest people like you and I left, Ronnie. Exactly. You know, <laughs> I we wouldn't <laughs> steal a thing. <laughs> wouldn't steal anything. <laughs> wouldn't uh, steal anything. Uh, Greg, your parents uh, would have gone through the itinerary with you before leaving and saying, right, okay, boys, you're going to get off of Naples now, you're going to hitchhike all the way up through there, through uh, France, into Belgium, whatever, whatever, all those places, and then eventually you get on a boat and go across to England. I think that's reasonable. What, that my parents would have double-checked yeah. the itinerary? Yeah, I would have thought that our parents would have thought, hey, that's, no, I don't like the sound of that. Oh, I don't know, mate. I can't remember that either. I think my dad was pretty cool about it. He just kept telling me to watch out for things. Yeah. I, I, been I, there and been involved in all that. Well, I... I there's and some... my mother gave me a complete botox to me to make sure that everything was in place. And um, and away we went and didn't do any of the things that she told me to do, which oh. was normal. No, yeah. was... <laughs> uh, both the boys have mentioned that you had to split up uh, to hitchhike to your destination. Ah, now you're ringing a bell, Ronald. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, is that when Ace went off on his own? Uh, correct. That's no right. Brownlee no one... didn't turn up. That's yeah. right. He was supposed to be there too. Yeah, well, he didn't have the money. And uh, he said that the, the, the only way to be able to, to get a ride was to uh, split up. And I think it might have been you and uh, Pistol together and, and Buzz, and, and uh, sorry, and Mick went by himself now. And then you suddenly had a rendezvous point where you just wait and hopefully That's right. meet, meet each other. Uh, was, yeah, now I remember now. We used to put one hitchhiker further back up the road. Yeah. And then, or two, but not three. And uh, when we get picked up, then we do the, can you pick up my mate? He's just around the corner, that routine. And I think that worked a fair bit. Um, that you then went to Munich Beer Festival. Yeah, don't remind me. Um, I was going to say, yeah, that interesting times that you just, Reminded me of a few things, mate. Yeah, we went to Munich, but uh, did they tell you that we virtually walked through Switzerland? Because they thought we were watch thieves, <laughs> standing there with our white trench coats and our suitcases in Jokin. <laughs> and those pictures that you look at are just an absolute classic. With our bulging suitcases with a bit of rope wrapped around the guts of it. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, that's my theory anyway. I tell people we virtually walked from one end of Switzerland to the other because they just did not want to pick us up. Anyway, uh, yeah, Munich Beer Festival. Yeah, I remember that. We tried to do what the, the yeah, Germans were doing, drinking these massive big steins of beer. And uh, I think we kept up reasonably well. And th that night, I remember sleeping in the station. I think it was Munich Station on the benches. Uh, there was nowhere else to stay. The place was packed. And I don't know whether the boys remember this, Ronnie. They were the that was the year when the headlines in Australia were Aussies wreck German beer festival. Oh, did you hear that one? I did. I did. I yeah. Um. That, that's, that, that, that all makes sense. There were some terrific uh, stories that cross-referenced there with you boys coming across to eventually come into England. And, well, uh, the one that Pester wouldn't have told you that I'm quite happy to admit is when I got on the ferry to go across to arrive in Dover, I was totally skint. I didn't have a razoo, and I'd supposedly saved up enough money to keep me going for 12 months. Unbelievable. <laughs> and it was all Pester's fault and Ogden's for Getting me involved in alcoholism. Oh. All right, that, that's, that's and, I've, yeah. and I've I've never looked back. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Um, just on that very point, uh, Mick said similar things about money. Uh, he ran out of money. Pistol said, "I think he said I'll loan you some money," and which he, he did. did. And and, I, and and Mick has also made reference that you went to the consul. Uh, the Australian house somewhere in Europe and got an advance on some money. Does that does that ring a bell? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know if I. Did. I don't think I did that. Yeah, uh, but, I think. Um, um, anyway, no, I, I, no. Pistol loaned me the money. Yeah, Pistol seems to be the man of money there, didn't he? Uh, he oh, mate, he was loaded. He's always been like that. Like you're, you're and I think it was only a matter of days after we arrived there that we were working. And, and this, got to England. Yeah, well, uh, what I what I understand, Greg, I'll just prompt your memory. Uh, you've gone across the channel, uh, the three of you. Um, Buzz is in Grove Road in Surbiton. Uh, he, um, Mick, by accident, met with Murray, Murray Fisher, and yeah. uh, invited you into Grove Road, and you all bunked into Grove Road as starters. Yep, that's right. And then you just were able to just walk into jobs pretty quickly. Oh, we didn't make a bet, mate. We were banging on doors all over the place. And what? I, uh, yeah, we did just about absolutely anything or everything. You remember all that, though, Ronnie? I do, I do. I you do. remember when I, you, when I did my degree at bakery work, you yeah. know, throwing the icing on top of cakes when they came out of the oven? Uh, but now, and, um, was, that, was that just you or was it Buzz or was it, was it Pistol? I don't know. I tend to have got a feeling there was someone else there because we both got the sack. Yeah, I think it was Brownlee because instead of putting the icing on the cakes, we decided to throw it on each other and got caught. So that was we were terminated for that. <laughs> that's that's incredible. I um pretty sure uh, that was Buzz and I. Just reflecting back on Pistol, uh, he said that he was pre-organised with a job already in England. When yeah, he, he was. Arrived. That, that, yeah, he was no. a, Pretty organised character, Pistol. Bloody ass, mate. Don't worry about the old piss. He was... Straight up to Newmarket, and he got himself involved up there and furthered his racing career. You know, he wanted me to go up there, but I just... Horses didn't like me, and I didn't like them that much, so I didn't go. Uh, I, I believe that uh, Mick Hobden's been accredited with the fact of finding Wright Road in Claygate. Oh, no, I'd have to dispute that one. He, he didn't. Unless he uh, came with me. Who, but um, who, I'm pretty sure I instigate, was the major instigator of that one. Uh, but uh, I'll stand corrected, though, of course, and I won't lose any sleep over it. Uh, uh, but you, you're saying no, I remember country. getting togged up in a suit and having this wonderful spiel that I put over. And um, as you can remember, those, Ronnie, got oh, us yes. through the shit a few times. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, I I got that that place, and then the other six hundred people moved in. All the other Pakistanis. 
Um, That's the one. Yeah. You, you, the four boys went out to play gay. Me, do you?